What will the future role of public space be? What are the new policies that public space needs? I think uh, to answer that, uh, one probably have to uh, look at the role of public space, at least historically, right? Um, and then I'll segue the historical purpose of a public space to what the, what the public space means for us right now. So as, as we all know, if we were to uh, talk about um, a, a Western-centric point of view from a historical point of view, we could look at the Agora, right? So the Agora was a big public plaza in uh, Greek times, and it was there because it was the exchange of everything, right? So if you, if you allow uh, that, that, that one definition of a, of a city or urbanization is a rapid and intimate exchange of desires, desires meaning economic desires, knowledge desires, meaning, right, companionship, um, that the Agora was that place, right? It, it was like, uh, it, was, it was my TV, it was my newspaper. It's where I hear all the rumors. It's where I could like sell my apple and, and get a piece of, of lamb, right? I mean, it's, it's, it was the center. Um, but what happened was that by having the Agora be the center, and then that evolved into like the piazza, the courtyards, the places, right? Um, it ended up being basically this one component where you had this binary relationship between, oh, you're in a private uh, space, like your apartment, right? Versus basically a public venue. So it was always this binary um, equation, right? And for, uh, for a long time, uh, I think as maybe as human beings, uh, maybe this binary uh, equation was okay because sometimes we wanna be by ourselves, private, and sometimes we want to be public, no problem. But as time moved on, it became an issue about space versus meaning, right? And so, and then as time even moved on now from the 20th century to the 21st century, the idea of the public park relative to, let's say, modernism, not, pre, uh, not neoclassical, not Renaissance, but basically modernism of the 20th century, really had to do with a binary relationship between uh, what is natural versus what is urbanized, as opposed to basically private and public. And so the, the shift started to move. And now uh, what I see that shift being accelerated is what I call um, what the center theme of my conversation with you for me has to do with this new idea of equity, okay? Spatial equity, access to equity, and equity of meaning, right? And so I would say, okay, it's not about the death of the public spaces, but if I'm here and I'm working and basically I don't need basically those public spaces to give and structure anything that I do in terms of my personal life nor my professional life, it's out there. <clears throat> what does that mean? It means now that basically the structure of what urbanism was trying to uh, dictate for me is no longer, uh, it lost its, its actually structural component. It allows me to be much more liberal and much more free, which also means that, for example, I could go to my park at any time I choose, right? The fact that for all of us right now, there's no difference between a weekend and a weekday, or at least for me, it's all blurring, right? It's all blurring. So uh, there's no more like, oh my God, you know, I need to go to the park. I want to go to the beach, but it's only the weekend. And oh, if I go on the weekend, there's going to be so many people and I hate that, but it's my only time. That, in theory, I would say is, uh, has been uh, extremely diluted. And in many ways, the idea that our focus focuses on, on, let's say, online conversation and online engagement allows us to enjoy public spaces and natural assets even better, right? It's not about the elimination of it. It allows them to actually be much more equitable and egalitarian in terms of its scheduling. Because a park and the beach will say, you know, I'm always here. You could come to me on a Wednesday or on a Sunday. It's always the same. And, and of course, uh, the other kind of funny joke in LA, as you guys know, is that the air has become super clean, right? Yeah, the air has become super clean. I love going outside now. And, uh, and despite basically uh, the tragedy of so many people dying from COVID, um, this was kind of like this really weird, unexpected shock to the system to basically tell humanity, it's like, you know, this is nature can be this uh, delicious. You know, the air can smell and taste so good. And we actually have much more of a, 
of a tempered way of living and it forces us to slow down. And of course, I think we all wish that we would be doing this without uh, a virus forcing us our hand. Uh, but I think to Shannar's question, it's about a, a spatial equity that right now the COVID-19 has uh, given us as opposed to these uh, binary systems that has, uh, I would say, kind of sh shaped us. Is there any like new policies you think will occur like uh, in different countries, new policies about public space, not only social distancing? What is your anticipation? I don't think there's any policy that, uh, I mean, other than social distancing, which I think we all hear about. Um, I haven't heard anything that much about it. I know there's been a, a larger discussion of, about um, embellishing certain kind of secondary public spaces with a better Wi-Fi, I mean, to uh, Emiliano's uh, right now current situation, that there is, an, and again, even access, again, it's about equity. Equity, meaning everybody has, a, has an even chance, right? There's no hierarchy. Uh, that there is uh, an equity of, of access in terms of, of basically Wi-Fi, in terms of basically 5G, right? And so everybody has more choices. And I think at the, at the very, very end, um, I know uh, this whole lockdown sounds highly restrictive and, and I know it feels like a police state, uh, but at the end of the day, if all that is lifted, um, I wonder, and if we're all allowed to still see each other in a restaurant and have a drink together at the end of the day, um, if we're allowed to do that, I wonder if this simply doesn't give us just much more choices, right? And just gives us more freedom. Right, and in many ways, if it in in the end, if it doesn't actually uh, liberate us uh, to make more individualized, customized lives, rather than being uh, forced into uh, this uh, traditional structure of the 20th century. What will be the future role of our streets? What will be the new forms of human transportation? Well, I, I, I think uh, it's kind of interesting, that question. Um, I would say you're combining two questions into one. Uh, because right now I'm doing, um, I'm doing a secret project that actually is, is involved with that right now. So the number one, I think this pandemic will, um, obviously I think it will be over, in, even in the most uh, conservative uh, estimation, I think it will be over hopefully by uh, mid next year. I mean, from a conservative point of view. Right. And then number two is that, uh, but what you're asking is uh, what does it actually, uh, it raises other questions that might not necessarily be about COVID, but is about the condition that COVID actually raises. Right. And my answer is yes. Uh, my answer is right now we're pursuing a future where the delineation between pedestrian and basically vehicles are seamless. It's actually one continuous surface that we call the universal surface. Right. And that um, with the advance of technology and with the advance of these, uh, these vehicles that are much more in tune with autonomy and, in, and intelligence and, a, and AI, that they will actually start to uh, blend seamlessly with us. But the most important thing that I've been advocating for and uh, right now what the Now Institute has been advocating for is a walkability. The idea to actually design cities in in a minimum of a two square kilometers to a maximum of maybe three to four square kilometers. But I would say two square kilometers right now is actually, uh, which is uh, roughly about one mile, by, it's 1.4 by 1.4 times that is, is two square kilometers, right? So 1.4 is roughly about one mile, right? 1.6 is a mile, right? So it's about a mile by a mile. And what a mile by a mile does is that it allows you to actually have a wonderful contemporary uh, village like a UCLA campus that allows basically uh, to practice walkability with minimum assistance of autonomous vehicles. And the autonomous vehicles, like you said, is only for delivery, only for the handicap, and only maybe for the sick and the senior citizens. But that's it. And primarily, we should just be walking. And I think, uh, you know, there's this organization called uh, I IATA, which is the governing board for airports international, right? And uh, you know, you ever wonder like, <clears throat> what's the largest airport I could design without uh, one of those uh, shuttle systems? The, the answer is 650 meters, okay? People think that you can walk 650 meters dragging a luggage with small assistance on a, on a, on a moving sidewalk if you want to, 
650 meters, right? And if you kind of rotate that, it means that within a two square kilometer, you need a little bit of an assistance, but you could actually put in maybe four uh, big airports and that now becomes like your town. So walkability, uh, I think right now is the main answer to your question of how we can live together with technology. What should be the role of technology and AI in rethinking the possibilities for public space? Can AI be used to control part of the city according to unexpected events? Okay, so I'll answer in two ways. Uh, first of all, I think technology um, is not going to be uh, symbiotically connected to, uh, let's say, a traditional open space like a, like a plaza or like a courtyard. I think uh, technology right now is going to be ubiquitous, you know, and um, a 5G um, network which is of course um, microwaves, it has to be located at every 500 meters. Every 500 meters of 5G station. 4G, two kilometers, okay? So this is why 5G gives you so much uh, service, but not very good for your brain, okay? But, it, it, but uh, what I wanted to kind of answer with you is, is uh, surveillance I think is gonna be ubiquitous, but you're asking about the role of basically the, the public space uh, more. If I were to design a whole new city from the ground up, I will still have these open spaces, but the open spaces for me are areas for landscape, for nature. So for me, it's the idea of nature, trees, plants, nature coming back into urbanity rather than like a hard plaza in the sense of, uh, let's say like this Renaissance planning, right? Or uh, anything that we, we've inherited from, uh, from Europe, you know? I'll give you a really, really funny thing. Um, in Asia, we don't have plazas. There's no plazas in China. There's no plazas in Korea or Japan. We don't have plazas. We just have big, crazy, fat streets that's like the Ramblas in Barcelona, okay? So we have big streets that are like everybody's mixing. You know, chickens are running everywhere, crazy restaurants, but it's not like this formal plaza, like this uh, Carlos de Camanos of, uh, of Roman town planning. It's like none of that, right? But if we were to insert things, I, right now what we're talking about is inserting uh, gardens and forest and nature. Yeah. So that nature and, and the steel and concrete of, of urbanism is tossed together like a salad, right? And so there's more access to trees and happy birds and, and, uh, and, and the binary element is, you know, hard urban, you know, or soft nature, right? Uh, rather than these other, um, areas that I think you and I know historically from Europe has been always about a control, right? The control of the state, right? The control or the ceremony of, let's say, uh, I mean, even something as beautiful as uh, Bernini's uh, uh, Plaza in, in the Vatican is about control, right? And so, but none of that is, 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 uh, is applicable anymore because that sense of control is going to be over online in, in how we're talking. Uh, so what's the value of, of anything outside as a group? For me and for us, it's about nature, you know? And at a certain point, if you cannot go too far to a forest, let the forest come to you into, into your city. So that's kind of where, where we are. And I'll give this little anecdote that I gave to, uh, to, my, uh, <clears throat> to my studio. A long time ago, there was an experiment in Korea where uh, they've uh, asked uh, these big, big technological companies like Samsung and LG to uh, sponsor a park. You know, the same way in America, you had these big companies sponsor like a stadium, like a football or soccer stadium, right? And uh, they did it. And so Samsung came in and they made this one park into like this incredible, like super Wi-Fi, right? This is a long time ago. So you were streaming, you were streaming 4G live movies in your, uh, in your phone, right? So these kids who were always stuck in their bedrooms, like, you know, with their, with their skin going pale, would actually go outside into the park and even though they're still looking at their iphone and not the trees at least at least their nose was bringing in uh, breathing in fresh air and their ears were hearing uh, birds chirping right and as a way of just using technology to to mix humanity and urbanism and nature together so i always think of that as a, as the next uh, kind of venue to do that but to kind of close up your question on surveillance right now i'm dealing with basically surveillance teams uh for uh, for the city because right now we're doing um we're doing about eight smart cities. Uh, surveillance, I have to tell you, is, is getting um, scary and ubiquitous. It's universal. So right now, the, the next measure of surveillance is not on urban spatiality, 
but it's on uh, what they call the cognitive awareness of each individual to uh, make a digital twin of yourself, right? So uh, Emiliano, it's like, okay, let's say you make a, a digital twin of yourself. That digital twin, you allow your digital twin to be completely contaminated, okay? To be completely corrupted, okay? Because that digital twin of yours is like a, like a shield, it's like a digital shield, right? And that digital twin also it allows you to be connected to the Amazon website and all this data, right? But you, as the a, as a inner core of data, is you're, you're protected, right? So right now, that's the next level of uh, surveillance and data uh, kind of management that we're, right now we're dealing with cities. And, and, and in this sense, uh, what is about the GIS mappings and all the things that you can also do, not tied related with AI, but is related with the satellite images and, and the GIS, ArcGIS, or whatever platform that you can use also to predict some kind of event as COVID-19 we are seeing right now. What do you oh, think? No, absolutely. absolutely. So, you know, with GIS, uh, so, So one of my uh, one of my roommates from um, from Harvard uh, was actually one of the first five people who founded uh, ArcGIS, Esri, ESRI, right? And I, of course, I didn't believe him because this was like 1994. I'm like, what are you talking about, right? But as we all know, uh, GIS is like the urban version of like a, like a BIM, right? It's all about spatiality. And I used to always remember he says he said one very profound, simple thing, which is anywhere, anything has a position and a location on this earth, okay? From the stupid trash can outside the building to you, there is everything has one point on, on the globe, right? And the knowledge that there's always this one geospatial location is power, right? Because with that, I could tell you what you're doing, where you are, what you're about to move, right? And so with that, they started to create this incredible network, to your point, on behavior patterns, Right, and that is going into uh, into a second or third generation of what they call like anticipatory uh, behavioral uh, patterning in terms of weather people. And so right now, you know who the number one uh, funder of uh, GIS is? It's the military and and um, and the CIA, right? Because with that, they could actually start to geo geospatially map all these areas. Um, and so with COVID. Right now, like with uh, with Asian countries, they're using it uh, to follow contact tracing, right? And but again, it all comes down to one thing: Do you allow yourself to be that one point that is surrendered to the system, right? To benefit, to benefit from the meta from the metadata. And then at the end of the day, uh, you know, we're only we're only going to be as good as smart as the data. Uh, that we are surrendering ourselves into. So uh, all these things that you brought up are mechanisms and platforms, but I think at the end, right now, there's a huge shift in terms of urban technology that has to do with our ability to uh, curate and turn off or turn on basically access to these uh, data portals. So yeah, the, yeah, the, the, the tech guys are, are definitely getting the more fun side of, uh, of, uh, of urban design nowadays. Um So um, the history of public spaces, you did mention that we're seeing less of a need for them today. And um, a lot of the spaces that we consider being public-like are maybe privately owned. Do you see this being an issue um, in the future context post-pandemic or if you don't, or not? No, 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 because I think, uh, you know, um, uh, I'm, I'm pretty liberal in terms of my um, economic positions, but I do realize the benefit of a, of a private owned uh, public plaza, right? And, I've, and there's a, there are several examples of that. And right now, in many ways, with a lot of these uh, triple P's, PPP, public private, public -private partnership, uh, you can't escape from having these big assets, these big infrastructural assets that you and I can call transportation, right? Subway, highways, bridges, plazas, right? Um, some of these things are all privatized, right? And, and we could debate endlessly about the privatization of public utilities and public infrastructure. But the fact of the matter is, in, depending on what country, what, what state you're in, uh, you are going to um, have these as a, as a mechanism, 
uh, to actually offer something back to the public. Now, you and I will never know it as, you know, you're chasing your dog around or I'm doing something else. But uh, yeah, the mechanism is, is definitely there. You know, I mean, think about it. When was the last time you actually, you guys actually had uh, like a classic kind of like an open plaza, like, you know, in a really pure Euro European way? Uh, there has been that many. It's been more hybridized, you know? There's a combination of parks and sculpture gardens. It's more like an art and cultural venue uh, rather than just like a hardscape open space, you know? Like, I'm thinking about, I just, the, the, my last plaza that I remember was in Madrid where like in a Playa Mayor, right? And uh, I think about it, just basically this huge vast space. And if the tourists were not there eating basically their over expensive paellas, like none of the locals were there, right? All the locals were in actually the streets where all the, uh, the, uh, the markets and all the farmers market were, right? The regular street. And that's where the activity was because there was a level of intimacy with the existing buildings. It wasn't this big kind of grand, uh, you know, state driven, uh, you know, like this big courtyard, right? That were actually usually reserved for, uh, for military uh, parades, right? So I think it's become much more hybridized. And like I said, for me at a personal level, it's all for me about bringing back nature. Mm -hmm. Think of it as just these big pots that are urban scale, right? Big planters, you know, the size of like huge blocks you know, like big, it's like the best example is a, is a tear garden in a Berlin, right? It's just a, just the forest just lands in the middle of it, right? And it just mm. gives you different access. Mm. But in terms of dealing with the existing cities we already have, where there's a lot less green space, a lot less public space, um, I guess we're seeing now post COVID, um, during COVID, um, a lot of different cities are opening. Uh, they're normally vehicular streets uh, on, uh, to pedestrians, like in Minneapolis, their Stay Healthy Streets program. They've completely closed some streets to vehicles. Um, do you think that'll be something in the future of uh, city design that uh, will be more and more uh, considered designing yes, absolutely. streets I mean for the public? Yeah, you know, uh, you know, Barcelona uh, started this program about three years ago, right? Where they started, uh, it was like a, a three by three, like a nine square grid, uh, where they blocked it off and they made it all internal pedestrian. Uh, the one pushback from the Barcelona uh, uh, example, which is an example, which is by basically um, a cautionary tale, is you know you got to pick the right block, because on that one they ended up picking a very very um, uh, an upper um, an upper income block. Right, so it only basically um, aided a certain sector of the society rather than basically redistributed, right? So that the social issue aside, uh, the privatization, the pet, making uh, streets pedestrian, I think is, is gonna be one of the routes that we're gonna move forward. Um, what they call, you know, street diets and all that. Uh, but I would say right now, uh, I, I go back to my earlier kind of observation about COVID, which is, uh, you know, at the risk of uh, using one of the COVID phrases, we're, we're flattening uh, the commute curve, so to speak, right? So whenever I do drive around, um, there's no more, you know, ru rush hour, right? The rush hour is, has all been flattened out. So it's more of an even stream of basically traffic that I'm seeing. And therefore, it's more of an even, uh, again, access and use of some of these public spaces that we, uh, we have as legacy as legacy public spaces, right? And, and in many ways, if you're trying to make a relationship between COVID and access of these uh, spaces, I would say in many ways, COVID helped us to uh, re-enjoy some of these open spaces because uh, I'm not pressurized into some sort of an artificial schedule, right? Socially speaking. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that, that I, I think is, is very interesting. Uh, concept. My my concern is not only all the people can have this kind of uh, freedom to work from your home or your your space and and have this kind of uh, efficiency that you need to work, uh, but some people can't do it at all. Like let's say the people who works in the construction, the people who works I don't know in a hospital, in 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 many specific types of of work. 
that's the Kobe wasn't very fair for for them or absolutely. Absolutely, Kobe was not fair to them. You know, you know who Kobe was not really, really, really fair to uh, are people who cannot afford a computer or an internet, right? I mean, you and I. I mean, right now we're we're talking like this as if everybody in the world has uh, electricity, has a room to talk to like this, and a computer, right? These things are super expensive when you talk to basically people with no means, right? So. You know, I deal a lot with uh, with Haiti, right? So I've been working down in Haiti for about six years, right? Right now, it's crazy. I can't talk to anyone uh, like that uh, except a regular phone. Um, I can't help them in any regards because there is actually no infrastructure and they don't want, they cannot social distance because they need to work, right? And in many ways, um, right now, what, what COVID does for these uh, for these countries is that uh, there is a, a grassroots, uh, a, a grassroots effort uh, where the work is more uh, informal. This is how they call it. It's more informal work. Uh, so the informality of the work that they do allows them to actually redistribute it over uh, over the night into the evenings, right? And so they're adjusting in into themselves. But no, you bring up an excellent point. Uh, we shouldn't take what we're doing here for granted, guys. You know, there's so many people here who can't even do this, right? And, um, you know, uh, it even basically forces this uh, separation in terms of some of the students that right now that we're trying to get, um, that all my friends are trying to recruit all over the world because in many ways, uh, the dependency on this larger set of technologies and this type of stuff is, is just not aligning with a lot of people. No, but yeah, but you're right. Um, uh, but I would say, yeah, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, sure. I, I, I would like to, to, to ask you in that regard, because at the very beginning, you talk about the new distribution of equality. And I was wondering, what about in the informal context where the digital infrastructure is not accessible yet? And like large communities are struggling with this pandemic situation because they don't have the access to the requested infrastructure somehow. So how can it be a good strategy to tackle that problem? So right now, the, uh, this is a really, really kind of a difficult discussion because on one hand, there's a whole group of us that was even before COVID, right? We were looking at, uh, at infrastructure, at infrastructure, uh, and by, by infrastructure, I, I mean the classic four, uh, energy, water, waste, and uh, communication, right? And we need a, a network to basically combine these, these four, uh, like a physical infrastructural system, but we couldn't. And so, the, you know, so uh, what I was always uh, taken by was that uh, the, the beauty of the informal system was that it allowed them to decentralize and to de-densify themselves spatially uh, across, um, across the city, right? And they were able to uh, create a much more of a robust human, human network of assistance that was driven by clan, family, tribes, people, right? In a very, very kind of old school way. Uh, but, you know, this wasn't uh, going to be resilient enough. And the resiliency had to do with having a group come in and build the most minimum, minimum infrastructural system that would allow maximization of their informal network. But we couldn't even get into the minimal because things were always, the polit politicians were being corrupt. There was always like disasters from like hurricanes. And it, it was just always a rush against time. And uh, I know what the answer would be in terms of money and in terms of time. But right now, we just couldn't find that, that one hole. This is right now, I'm working in Ghana. I'm working in Kenya. I'm working in Haiti. Um, I was partially working in uh, Puerto Rico. And it's it's a it's the same situation going around. Is what is the most minimum infrastructure for me to maximize their informality? And I couldn't even get that in that minimum going. Um, so at the end, end of the day, uh, what we can all do is we maximize the potentiality of what is available to us, right? As thinkers and as designers. For me, thirty percent of my energy is way outside of academics. I engage government, okay? So my hands are always dirty. These hands are always, always dirty because I deal with reality, right? Okay, like 
crazy reality. Good, bad, everything, right? Because for me, everything that we talk about for me is meaningless unless it, it, it can actually have some traction outside in, in the real world, yeah. even if it's 5%. Yeah, yeah, sure. You know? I agree. So, so sometimes the answer is not clean, you know? <laughs> but, you know, I got I to gotta try to do it. That was, was great. Great. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna ask you a couple. I'm gonna ask you a few uh, more personal questions, still related to everything. Sure. Um, in terms of uh, your own experience, um, now that you're not traveling uh, for work anymore, you've spoken a bit about this already. How has your life experience changed, and how has your practice uh, being a partner at Morphosis changed? Well, I'll tell you, um, one thing we all realize is that um, in some ways, thank God that um, we have just the, um, a working technology right now to even get us at this level of communication. I, I can only imagine that if this happened like 10 years ago, uh, where I was dealing with basically like first generation Skype and all this, like this would have been like maddening. Like, I don't think we could have actually done this. So prefacing that uh so number one number two is i think there's going to be a rapid acceleration of basically technology when it comes to basically interface right um i was dealing with uh, my friends over at mit and right now they're talking about full-scale digital walls so that when i'm talking to you you are real size it's almost like it's almost like you're just standing on the other side of a glass wall right a glass window right but with that real scale is the idea that they could actually project, let's say, a scene from uh, Buenos Aires. And so everything would be real perspectively, spatially, it will be real. It will be basically, pick your favorite cafe uh, so that from, uh, from Argentina, and imagine that right there, like as if outside of your uh, LA uh, apartment, boom, right there, right? It's like Alice in Wonderland. So right now they're working on that and they're, uh, the technology is there, they're trying to make it cheap, but I think this is, is accelerating. Uh, the geospatial collapse of what it means. And, and for all of us, uh, I guess the big question is, is um, can narrative be enough to drive urban meaning? If we see, if we hear, even though we're not experiencing, but if we see space, even though our body is not going in there, how much of that is meaning in terms of, of, a, of a, a certain level of satisfaction, right? Or does my body have to be there, walking around, moving in there? So I think this is thing is going to accelerate. Number two, uh, working. We took a poll of all our people. We have about 70 people at, at Morphosis, right? About 50, 55 out of 70 all wants to work from home because right now it's been seamless. Uh, we have a way of working. Um, all our guys are, are really, really advanced in terms of technology. So everything, I mean, right now, the, the two worst guys inside Morphosis is me and Tom. We're like the two, like, least technological. So it frustrates us. Uh, but for everybody else, it's like, it's like seamless. They're just like shrugging their shoulders. It's like, why break this, right? And then for a lot of other people who are married with children, um, better quality of life, I'm here uh, taking care of my 87-year-old mother. And so it allows me to, like, you know, look after her. So there's... I would say, if you're to ask me, put a gun to my head and says, okay, what do you prefer? I would say right now, this is working really, really well. Just allow me in the evenings to occasionally get together with my friends, right? Over some wine, some nice dinner, talk in the evenings. I mean, even after COVID is over, right? But to work in this. So in the office, we've agreed that maybe uh, two times out of a week, we could actually meet as a, as a collective because certain decisions uh, need to be done much quickly. And then also uh, for Tom and for us, some of the old schoolers from, last, uh, from the last century, we're much better in terms of sketching with our hand, right? We sketch with our hand, it's easy. I could do it in like two seconds that I cannot do in my damn uh, tablet on my, on my monitor, right? With, uh, with my little mouse, right? So um, in that regard, it's, it's, a, it's a balance we're trying to strike. What is talking about working at home and being at home and doing like a bunch of stuff simultaneously it's almost like a new paradigm of the geolocalization of your friend 
because now, even though you are not moving physically, you are geolocated in, in different places because you are here in my computer and in Emiliano's computer and in Shanar's and Larissa's computer, but also maybe you are answering a text in your phone to Korea. So you are also like, you are exploding yourself in no, different- Absolutely, and then I bring I bring back the old uh, the word I've been using, which is uh, uh, equity, right? And so you know we used to have uh, you know because I run all the Asian projects, so I have like two managers out in Asia, right? And they they used to always uh, be pissed off because we, we would always have regular meetings, and they would always be the one in the monitor. And now, of course, everybody's equal, right? Everybody's equal, so that's that's awesome. And then for Tom, <clears throat> one of the clear benefits <laughs> that I realized at Cyarc. Uh, above everything else was that all of a sudden Tom goes, you know what? I could call all my best friends from all over the world. And these are like the top architects, right? The top architects in the world that normally they could never fly. They're too busy. They're too expensive. And boom, they're all there, right? And so in many ways, it, it's, been, uh, it's, been, it's been fascinating. I would not say like one's better or not, but uh, it's it's a, it's a it's a reality I accept. Thanks. I'll say two things. Uh, number one, I think there is a, you brought up construction workers and all that, right? So uh, I would say right now, um, this this forum, I think we can all accept. Unfortunately, it's somewhat into um, a service oriented industry, right? It's a white collar, service oriented. It's about those of us who use more of our brains than um, than our body. Okay, let's just be very very frank about that reality. So uh, I think. And, that, and that's something that I'm always um, uh, kind of aware of. And then, um, and then number two, this forum works well, I found out when uh, things are aligned in terms of conversations, uh, when things are not aligned and there's a lot of problems. Um, I miss sometimes my old technique, which is I, I go and, and, and meet with them privately, right? Off on the side and there's different mechanisms. And especially for me, I come from, I mean, you know, I'm 52, right? So I'm not, I'm not that old, but I definitely, as a, as, a, as a generation, I belong to the upper group of people where uh, a lot of the solutions and problems are always negotiated on one-to-one, -one, right? And, and I, and I kind of miss that. And whenever I talk to uh, my younger staff, for them, it's, 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 it's more of an, uh, of an abstraction, you know, because, uh, you know, my job is, uh, is uh, I have to, uh, I have to solve problems, right, at a, at a deep level. So uh, those little things are off, but uh, absolutely. Access to the world, the world has now all flattened out into basically uh, an, uh, an egalitarian um, point. Absolutely. Time, no time difference. Every morning I wake up at, uh, at four because I work in, uh, in the Middle East and all the Middle East projects start at four o'clock, four o'clock LA time, right? And so, yeah, everything's collapsed. Do you think um, a certain level of comfort that we have right now working from home, aside for the the one-on-one -on -one meetings that are actually very helpful, do you think that as we pick up speed again in the economy um, that we will still retain this awareness that, that maybe we're hustling too much, maybe we're flying too much, maybe we can have more meetings online? Um, oh, 100%. Or do you, do you keep going 100%. back to no, 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 no. I will, I will tell you from my side of the business, and I'm not even talking about Cyarch, I'm not even talking about academics, I'm talking about just, you know, just down and dirty, like nasty business side. Uh, everybody loves this. It's working. You know, it's not, it's like because the technology allows, allows it to be seamless. Now, 30% of, uh, of, uh, of the examples are from like the CEOs and from the chairmen who hated this, right? Who hated this, who couldn't deal with this thing, right? But they were forced to do this, right? And in the beginning, it was really funny because they couldn't know where the camera was. They, their face was like off to the center, right? The light was not on their face. It, it was just, it was bad. It was like watching your dad like do like the worst horrible thing, right? But at the end, they got into it and then like, oh, this is great. I could just be in my, in my desk. I don't have to go to the conference room. Fuck, I love this. Now, this is like the CEOs, right? And so, yeah, this thing is getting institutionalized even much more uh, than at, at, let's say, more of a theoretical academic level. Working-wise, 
This is much better. I mean, think about this, guys. I mean, you, you know the statistics right now. Uh, Wall Street right now in New York, right now they're, they have to face the fact that maybe uh, 20 to 30 percent of the real estate is going to be available or not used, right? So I have a lot of these companies that are actually defaulting on their lease because they don't need it, right? Also for transportation, right? Oh, it's, it's, it's going to be unbelievable. unbelievable. I mean, uh, in my office, uh, the 15 that do want to come, now they really want to come because they realize they got the entire office to themselves, right? It's not a rotation. It's like the whole office. I got two desks. I got, yeah, it's, 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 uh, it's like first class, right? But it's, 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 it's all about choices, it's all about options. Yeah, on, on that regard, I, I live right now in the middle of downtown, which is full of offices. And when I take my walks, like seeing all that big buildings empty, made me think which will be the new typology for this kind of works because if the home office is really working we won't need so much square meters for offices absolutely so, so how can we transform that in a new kind of typology for the urban city? and then now the next thing that we're talking about is you know kind of uh you know industry 4.0 manufacturing and fabrication Right, so industry 4.0 is you know this magical uh, age where everything will be um, robotics and automated, and you're now making all these things in this pure, clean white spaces that look like out of Tron. Uh, and even then, the whole idea of minimum human human beings in uh, in fabrication and manufacturing that's a huge next paradigm shift. I mean, yes, I know, I know, we've been looking at robots uh, in cars, but I mean, just think about it, like. At what point do you still need humans physically in their jobs? Is it medicine, right? Maybe teaching uh, the young children, maybe kindergarten, elementary school, because there has to be a level of uh, basically human-human uh, rapport, but maybe not after high school or middle school. You know, like ask yourself, what, what is the most minimum where you still need human-human bodies, you know? Which is, which of course that question uh, uh, infers, at what point is something more important than just transfer of knowledge, right? You know, um, so that's, that I think is right now the, uh, the other way to think about it. Related to the new paradigm that you're talking about, like I'm wondering what will happen to the ideas of density, urban density that we were like hyper density, everything because of the climate change. Uh, it was something that everybody was looking for, all the urban designers and everything. But now, yeah. like a lot of like, for example, normal people, uh, they're moving to like more or less dense places. They prefer to live there. What will happen to all those ideas? What do you think about it? So you just Shantar brought up Kibari, manifestos. What will happen to them? You, know, you brought up a, uh, an epic, epic online online debate last night uh, with basically this group of uh, of urbanists. Density, the dance fight, right? And you ask yourself, why, why, why are, why are we uh, densifying? Is because there's an efficiency in terms of access, right? And there's a a, a multiplication of basically these catalytic moments where, um, you know you could do three things with one action. But right now, um, if there is a, a better choice of life where you could out be in suburbia with your amazing trees, but you're not, um, you're not guilted into uh, being thinking that I have to now commute to the city, it actually now changes the paradigm, right? Um, I, I think we have to kind of wait and see because right now, you know, there's like this cliche that uh, the the low density of LA basically helped us deal with COVID versus the high density of New York. That's right now is a cliche right now that everybody's talking about, right? Uh, but it also, because I'm a density guy, I like density, you know? Uh, I like intensity. That's and why I, I asked that's, you. No, <laughs> that, that, that's, you. That's why I think that's why uh, a city is, is made for um, an intense interaction of services and goods and, and people and desires, right? Um, but when you're apart and those desires and those exchange of goods are still met online, then I have to start asking, 
okay, what, what do I need offline, right? What do I need offline? And uh, yeah, Shannara, you might, you, you have to ask me in two months. And I think, I have, yeah, 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 we're, I, we're looking at a whole new paradigm. Yeah. And, and the this idea is where, sorry, no, the idea of where sustainability, us, right? What's that? Sorry, the idea of sustainability works into this as well. No, 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 absolutely, absolutely. So, I mean, even with sustainability, there's always been half of sustainability has been the issue of cars, right? Uh, issue of mobility, right? Issue of basically uh, utilities. And if those are now, if, if we don't need mobility and uh, utilities are now self-defined and self-preserved in your own uh, commune or your own um, kibbutz or your own house, you know, now we're, we're, we're going back uh, dangerously to uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's you know, a uh, broad acre city, right? Where Frank Wright envisioned one family per one acre <laughs> rolled out across the American carpet, right? You know, and you got your own farm and you are king and queen of your one acre, right? 4,000 square meters of uh, space, you know? And if you got technology that's connecting you to everybody, to Uncle Joe and your friend Jane over on the other town, why not? Big question mark, right? Yeah, then the question should be, is, is it infrastructural efficient <laughs> to be What's one acre? Part? Is it like infrastructural efficient having one family per acre? I mean, I mean, this was Frank Loret. I mean, I'm not advocating for No, Frank no, for Loret. sure. I'm saying basically this, uh, this weird uh, suburban uh, uh, detensification pattern as a... <laughs> as an organism, as a diagram that would actually allow itself to perpetuate, uh, will dangerously become a uh, Frank Wright's one acre, <laughs> one acre per family, right? Because for him, for Frank Wright, it was about freedom, you know, in a different way. Okay, for him, it was about uh, the American dream uh, came back from like the, uh, like the settlers from like the old uh, Western days from the Cowboys, right? It's like, uh, I am, I, I am the shaper of my own destiny, right? Whatever I do, the success or the failure is through my own two hands. It's this very kind of romanticized notion of uh, of the American of the American uh, settlers, uh, and he tried to make that into basically uh, this concept for American urbanism, right? Uh, as a counterpoint to the Columbian Exposition in Chicago of of, uh, of the late 1800s, you know, which was like very Eurocentric. So you know, Frank Lloyd Wright wanted something that's like very American, you know. Um, but now in this, uh, in this COVID uh, um, technology, it's funny because, you know, uh, you, uh, I think some of the questions you guys talk about pandemics and COVID, but I think in reality, what you're really talking about is, is, the, uh, is um, the questions that COVID raises. It's not as if COVID will perpetually exist, you know, for many, many years, right? So it's the issues that you raise, which has to do with density, with the uh, ability of technology to, uh, geospatially collapse, collapse space, right? Or collapse meaning of space, collapse the, uh, the reading of space, right? And is a collapse of the reading of space, the meaning of space enough for us to kind of move forward uh, with the way that we actually uh, engage a piece of land on this earth? Yeah, in that, in that sense, the cliche of Los Angeles as a low density city and, and New York, the high density, in terms of these kind of play games, uh, when you talk about very high dense cities in Asia, none of them have, have had problems with the COVID. I, I really dense cities, so Seoul, exactly. Hong Kong, this guy. Exactly. exactly, a lot of that, uh, exactly what you bring up, Amelia, there's a is a proportional amount of excessive uh, group behavior uh, to even offset basically the, uh, the density. And it's, uh, for me, it's, it's been a, a very kind of fascinating uh, urban psychology in terms of how people behave. It's like, I'll bring up another uh, disaster, which was earthquakes, okay? So, uh, and I'll bring up three countries, Haiti that, that I've been working in, Haiti, uh, Fukushima, and, um, uh, uh, the one in uh, the one in China uh, it starts with an S H Shanxi, and what happened with uh, with these earthquakes is that uh, after the earthquake, uh, all the different countries <clears throat> went back to their root behavioral uh, behavior. So, in Haiti, 
everybody started to become artists, okay? And, and cultural produ production. So they start to like make art out of uh, the damage. They start to like paint the rubble, right? So they were trying to erase uh, the disaster by converting it into beauty, right? It was like for them, it, it was like taking ownership of the disaster as if uh, I don't want to acknowledge that there was a, uh, an evil God, but I will now become the God of my place and I will convert everything into beauty. Okay, that's the that's Haitians. Uh, um, Japan, after the Fukushima, you know what everybody did? Everybody ended up just like lining up like a military. You know, grandmothers, grandparents, all these stores were open. No one looted. No one even dared to like break in and steal like a, uh, like a TV or something, right? It was, even though everything was like naked, right? Everybody lined up. There's one guy with a, with a pump. And instead of like people just mobbing them, people just got themselves into this, this like 500 meters straight line, right? There's no police. No one is like telling them, it's like, get in line, get in line. It was all because of right here, of the way that we deal with it, right? In Haiti, one pump, but they make beauty out of it, right? Right? In China, after basically the valley collapsed, no one wanted to do that because it, it became like an evil spiritual place. So everybody went back up to the mountains to their old uh, tribal herds. Okay. They literally got themselves physically away from the entire geography that was the earthquake. Okay. Where in Haiti and the people in Japan, they were in it, but they were dealing with it in two different ways. And I bring this up because I think uh, it really... Uh, kind of uh, culturally has to do with how people will deal with, let's say, the questions you, you guys bring up here today, right? And it goes back to uh, what I was like, talking about with uh, Soledad in terms of her teaching, that there's one thing is to teach knowledge, but the other thing is how to teach that knowledge and feed that food to people coming with different cultural backgrounds, right? And it's the same thing with disasters is how they basically deal with it. Am I all going to get together? Am I just going to say, fuck you all. I'm going to kill you guys. And I'm going to go in this survival mode. And it really, really comes down to, uh, to that. And uh, that's, I think, maybe till the end of maybe this year, I think a lot of uh, urban anthropologists will be studying this phenomenon for, for, uh, for quite a while. You know. Your personal experience, how this like shift to digital learning is changing the way you engage with teaching, and if there will be any possibilities of change after that, like having a, a critical reflection on the teaching and how you will lead it for the future. Yeah, I think um, I think in, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a it's a it's a work in progress right now. Um, I think one of the highlights of the teaching, like I said, was uh, from uh, from Tom's side was to have all these amazing uh, jurors <clears throat> to actually uh, honor uh, the work that was done by um, our studio, right? So I think on that one, well, that was fantastic. I think in the beginning, um, I think uh, Tom was a little bit uh, kind of out of sync in terms of how to actually engage the design because he likes drawing and he likes interacting with it. And uh, as we all know, one of the things about uh, this online is like it's, uh, it's equivalent to when you show a PowerPoint or something uh, like a linear digital projection. It's linear, and you're defined by that monitor as opposed to a wall of information where I could make my own personal connections of information, right, as a jury member. But I cannot do that. I am forced and driven and controlled by the direction and the narrative of the student's presentation, right? And so in that regard, it forces basically the students to be more conscious of the sequence of presentation. I mean, we all know this. I mean, everybody's driven with that, but even more so now than, than ever, right? And, and because, uh, you know, sometimes it's just a voice and there's no complimentary other, um, other assets or other draw drawings, uh, the students almost have to now present this thing as if you're giving like a lecture, you know, because there is no other secondary big posters or drawings uh, behind me, right? It is completely linear. And in many ways, uh, there's a whole different psychology and layout to how the presentation is done. In terms of teaching, 
I think we just have to play by ear. I think right now um, I, I, we, I have a pretty good idea what the topic is going to be for the summer. Um, and I think in this conversation, uh, I think it's, it's going to be seamless. I think it's going to be seamless. Obviously, me, as, just a, as a human being, I love to see these guys. These guys are, are really warm, amazing, smart uh, students. And I love to see them. But uh, I realize that from a teaching point of view, there's uh, ways of communication that actually Zoom or Teams or any of these other platforms have actually um, allowed us to, to work. So <clears throat> I don't see any big problems. I do understand that there is a, there is a <clears throat> discussion on how we can uh, have SciArc as a, as a building be available for some sort of a venue, but I, I don't know where that discussion is right now. So 